Hello everyone and welcome to CT Microbiology. My name is Clark and I'll be taking through HIV and AIDS this evening. I want to shout out to Nikki Shaw for creating uh, this PowerPoint which I have adapted and edited in some extra information to help you in your studies. So to begin things off uh, when discussing HIV, um, it's, order, it's nice to know where what HIV is. And so uh, it's one of uh, uh, the viruses found within Alentivirinae. Um, it's uh, a group six virus, which is your single sense RNA positive sense um, retrovirus. Uh, HIV specifically has two copies of this single-stranded RNA uh, positive sense in its, uh, in its genome. And uh, the structure, the one that we want to particular emphasize is the D-type, uh, which is that uh, cylindrical nucleocapsid core. Um, they're like emphasizing that for exam purposes. So symptoms are, uh, it, it can cause neurological disorders in addition to uh, immunosuppression. And uh, this is caused uh, from HIV-1. Uh, and most specifically, the more most common form of this is actually group M subtype B. Uh, that is the most common HIV-1, group M subtype B is the most common found worldwide. And then HIV-2 is uh, another virus found in, in, within this group. Uh, there's other subtypes uh, besides B, such as C and E. Uh, these are transmitted heterosexually and uh, E is transmitted more uh, between sexual partners than is the most common around the world, which is B. Subtype D, D uh, is another one that is more associated with vertical transmission than most of the other subtypes. Um, and so that's uh, kind of more specific questions. Just someone comes with uh, HIV, they have subtype D, this is most likely how, um, and they're probably talking about an infant that has vertical transmission, or if it's C and E, it's maybe something like heterosexual uh, or sexual partner. So uh, what are retroviruses? So retroviruses are viruses that have RNA genome that uh, once they enter into cells, they take their RNA genome and turn it back into uh, DNA genome. And then that can be uh, incorporated into host cells um, genetic material. And so there's uh, two types of retroviruses that you should understand. One is uh, a simple retrovirus. So this is something like HTLV uh, is, is a great example. Uh, so which is a human T cell lymph lymphotrophic virus. Uh, one, and uh, this is not HIV. HIV is a complex retrovirus, not a simple. So simple retroviruses have a GAG, which is a group specific antigen, um, which is like the core and capsid proteins. Uh, it also has a Paul gene, which creates your polymerase, such as your RT, uh, your protease and integrase. And then it also has an M for envelope or glycoproteins. And that's uh, important for those proteins for attachment and reinfecting different cells once it buds off, you know. And uh, complex retroviruses such as uh, HIV have these same genes, the GAG and Paul and M, but they also have accessory genes such as your TAT, REV, NEF, VIF, and VPU. Um, and one thing that you should definitely know in complex retroviruses is, is that they actually have uh, more open reading frames than simple ones. So um, they actually have nine open reading frames. And then n within uh, those open reading frames, so pretty much you have a gene. So you have uh, a gene uh, genome here, and it's really a long thing right here. And uh, we would have a promoter sequence here, to, and then we'd have our, our, our polymerase to come in, and uh, they would continue down here, either uh, uh, something to uh, make our uh, genome from or to make uh, complementary strands, so and then that could be going to make like protein or something like that, uh, to go find some ribosomes, anything uh, in, the, in this process. We have this promoter and, and primer kind of or promoter region over here that we start. Well, this is known as a reading frame, this opening sequence here. Well, how about we open it in multiple regions? Uh, and this can be, uh, this is what we call uh, multiple open reading frames. And so these are different areas that are, our polymerase can come and read these different genes and just produce those proteins or uh, those uh, kind of subsequent matching um, uh, RNA uh, pieces uh, here. And so uh, this actually in complex retroviruses have nine open reading frames and then that leads to a production of 15 proteins. So how do you get from nine reading frames to 15 proteins? Well obviously it makes sense that you're making polyproteins that just get cleaved into smaller uh, protein pieces and then those can function as multiple. So say I have my first open reading frame that makes 
three proteins, which totally makes sense as how you can get to 15. And so this is something in the difference between complex retroviruses is that you have more uh, open reading frames and you have even more uh, proteins. And you should know this 9 and 15. This is actually pretty high yield for exams uh, to know specific for HIV. It's uh, these small details that they like for, for this guy. And do you know them kind of? Uh, what happens is once we uh, get our virus inside, uh, we create what is known as a provirus. So we form uh, DNA uh, from our uh, RNA template, and then that integrates into the genome, and this is known as a provirus. Uh, it is not a prophage. Prophage is when you have a virally infected bacteria, and that's why we call it a phage. When it's a virally infected human cell, we call it a virus, and so that's known as a provirus. And uh, pretty much this provirus is the template for synthesis of viral mRNA for the genome and for the mRNA to make their proteins uh, associated. So then we can kind of put proteins and we can put genomes uh, in here and we can have other proteins like our, uh, our um, RDDP, which is our reverse transcriptase. And we can package this out, um, make an envelope over here with our little associated envelope proteins. And then we have, look, an HIV virus over here, and that can be secreted. And then uh, we also have this viral mRNA. So this is a non-structural and viral structural proteins can come off of this mRNA protein. So this is uh, everything I, I just pretty much have discussed. So HIV, so where did, where did this come from? Uh, so the origin, it was discovered in about 1983. And uh, there were three theories as to where this had come from, such as contaminated oral polio virus uh, or vaccine in Africa, uh, even smallpox vaccine contamination, or that it could have been acquired from non-human primates uh, directly. Um, because there is a simian uh, uh, immunodeficiency virus, or SIV, uh, this is why we were thinking maybe it had originated from that virus and then had progressed into uh, what we know now as HIV. Remember group M um, and subtype B is the most common, and that is the most common of global epidemics. So transmission, how do you get HIV? You can get it from blood, semen, vaginal fluid, so unprotected anal, vaginal, or oral sex, you can get this through. Um, sharing needles and syringes, uh, vertical transmission through the placenta, and male circumcision is protective against this. Um, as it is for many carcinomas, such as uh, uh, involving with papillomavirus as well. Um, and I just put a little syringe down here. It's a little Lego syringe. I wish I had one of those when I was a kid. Um, all right, so HIV proteins. Um, so these are actually really important to know, each of them, um, especially the first four that uh, I have emphasized here. And so what happens is we talked about some of the genes that HIV has, and one of them is your envelope, or ENV protein. So your envelope protein pretty much uh, is associated with making proteins that are going to be bound and hooked into the envelope, allowing for further infection to take place. And so um, what are these glycoproteins on the surface? And these are your GP41 and GP120. But first, what we need to do is make a big G, uh, glycoprotein, then we need to cut it into two small pieces. So that big glycoprotein is known as 160. So that is actually what is straight produced from your envelope protein. So remember how we talked about reading frames, we make a protein from here, and then we chop that protein into multiple pieces. This is how we get those 15 proteins from the nine open reading frames, is this is an example of one that makes two. So we have an uh, envelope um, gene that produces envelope protein, which is your GP160. Cut it into two, your 41 and 120, because um, scientists really love math, and they know that 41 plus 120 equals 160. Just so you know that, um, in case you thought it was actually 161 from your math training in elementary school and high school and college and just general life, um, you've actually been, uh, you lied to all your life. It actually is 160. 41 plus 120 is 160, just so you know, okay? Um, uh, don't, don't make that mistake, okay? We're in medical school, we're now smarter now, we don't wanna make that simple math mistake, okay? So GP120, uh, this is actually the surface component uh, of the protein, so we have this emphasized up here in the, in the um, light green here. And uh, this is actually what binds to the CD4 molecules of T cells. And uh, this is actually important as far as its pathogenesis. Also, we have our GP41, which is kind of the thing that hooks GP120 and holds it into the membrane, is a transmembrane protein but it also is important for fusion of that membrane. So what happens is we kind of bind to that CD4, <clears throat> we bind to co-receptors, which we'll be discussing, 
and then we bring the membranes a little bit closer. And uh, this GP41 allows for the direct fusion of those membranes together, so then this virus can, uh, can enter. And so what we can do is we can actually target this GP41 and block that uh, membrane fusion uh, altogether with Infuva. Infuvertide. And so that just makes sense that infusion or enfuvo is blocking infusion or fusion. And uh, GP, or I'm sorry, not GP, but P24 is the capsid protein that uh, kind of surrounds here. So this is your purple capsid protein. Um, and this is your nucleid capsid. This is your conical shaped thing that I just was discussing. And uh, this is actually what we search for on PCR. So remember when we talked about hepatitis B virus infection, um, and so when someone is infected with hepatitis B, we look for antibodies against surface, and we look for antibodies against capsid. And so that um, anti-C, right? So anti-HBC antigen uh, antibodies is something we look for. And when you see both of those positive, that means this person has been over their, they're over their infection, but it actually was an infection. It wasn't just um, our vaccination. Remember, vaccination was just the surface molecule, um, but if you have an antibody towards the core as well, or this capsid protein, then that's something uh, that to say this person had an infection. And so this, uh, this P24 is actually equivalent to that C of hepatitis B, uh, that core protein. This is the capsid protein. So this is known as P24, and this is what we look for on PCR. And so we want to um, we want to see if the, the cells are actually uh, producing this. We can also find antibodies against this, and this is something that tells us pretty much this person is infected with HIV. This is our confirmation test. So that's why we, we look for that guy. Um, also, uh, P7 and P9, these guys make up the nucleocapsid protein, um, which just surrounds uh, the uh, the RNA found within here. Remember when you have single-stranded um, like RNA or DNA, it's not very stable. RNA is a little bit more stable than uh, DNA, however, but it's still not that stable. So we want to kind of cover it up and protect it. And that's with our uh, little nucleocapsid proteins. And that is P7 and P P9. We also have um, one last protein I want to kind of quickly uh, mention here, which is your uh, P17. And so P17 is just important for um, uh, your nucleo or your, um, it's actually a protein found right here, this really small one right here at the tip of here. Uh, and it's only pretty much important uh, as far as a matrix protein. Uh, that's this, uh, this, these blue things right here. Uh, see all this blue around here? These are just matrix proteins that kind of holds everything all together and keeps the membrane's uh, shape intact uh, for the virus to, to infect optimally. And that's what our P17 protein is for. All right, so now on to the life cycle. This is actually really, really important. You need to write this out a couple times. And I, I have some helpful ways to remember some of the aspects of this. Um, but this is actually super important for you to understand because there's going to be a lot of questions that come from this. Um, as far as HIV. HIV is one of the most high yield things of microbiology that you will have um, because it's so common, it's so rampant, and we need to know um, how everything works. Because if, if you actually learn through this, it, it, learn all of these steps and how it works and how we kind of put our drugs and treatments for this, you, when you get to farm, it's going to be no problem. It's going to be so so easy for you. Uh, so I want to emphasize a good ways of, of learning this. Um, and so you, you can uh, kind of cruise through this section in farm. So uh, the HRV life cycle starts with binding and fusion. So I talked about GP120 and how that binds to your uh, CD4 molecules found on your T, T cells. And uh, once it binds those, pretty much what it needs extra is a co-receptor. And we're going to talk about those co-receptors in just a second. And once it binds those co-receptors, this kind of double binding allows for closer interaction between um, kind of that capsule or that envelope of the virus and, and the membrane of the host cell. And this close proximity allows for GP41, which is that kind of transmembrane protein, uh, to do its job. And its job is pretty much to cause that last step infusion of those membranes together. And that allows that RNA uh, or the vi RNA uh, pretty much the virus to enter into the cell and that releases the RNA into the host cell. And uh, so these co-receptors that bind actually kind of depend on uh, the stage of infection you have. And so when you have a naive infection, so someone that just got stabbed with a needle, 
um, at, a, at a hospital and, and that needle was recently in someone that had HIV and then they got they got uh, pr pricked with it and so we need to start them on treatment but however this infection in them actually is uh, first going to be used uh, utilizing the co-receptor CCR5 so this is found um, on uh, T cells it's also found on macrophages and macrophages those are a huge aspect of the initial infection of HIV is because HIV goes and it lives in macrophages and macrophages take it all over the entire body and just spits it out all over in our lymph nodes. Uh, remember macrophages when they phagocytize stuff they go okay I need to bring this now over to my lymph nodes. So they bring it over the lymph nodes and they go hey look what I found. Well this is a problem because when they say look what I found lymphocytes uh, like, hey, look what I found, T-cells. Our T-cells, don't don't bring that drug. Ah! And then the T-cells get infected. So uh, as far as how does it get in macrophages, it uses this CCR5. It also infects those um, uh, naive T-cells uh, via this co-receptor. And how we can block this, uh, so we can actually block CCR5 specifically with Maraviroc. This is a... a um, co-receptor blocker uh, as far as stopping uh, the initial uh, infection. And then we can also have, uh, once uh, you have had this infection for a while, HIV actually utilizes on T cells a different co-receptor, and this is known as CXCR4. So I remember this is when you've crossed this or X'd this before, so CXCR4, when you've crossed this before, um, meaning that this is a later stage uh, in, in this infection, then you use that CXCR4 as your co-receptor. And this is so, so high yield. And I was like, oh, this is a free point with that uh, little mnemonic right there. It just says, oh, someone's had HIV for a while. What co-receptor are they using? Well, well, they've crossed it before. And so they've had it for a while, and that's uh, CXCR4, which is nice. So... Um, Next stage that happens is once this uh, MR, or RNA has uh, kind of been spit into the cytoplasm, or plasma, uh, um, there's also uh, a protein that comes along with it, which is your ver reverse transcriptase. This was found within the nucle uh, within the nucleocapsid along with the RNAs, and uh, what this does is now is active and it converts single-stranded RNA into double-stranded DNA. This is known as a reverse transcriptase or uh, your RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, RDDP, RDDP. Okay, so that is uh, your reverse transcriptase. We can inhibit this with uh, two classes of drugs, your non, uh, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors and non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. Um, these guys actually bind the, the enzyme itself in an allosteric site and stop it from working. And then these guys actually uh, kind of inhibit the, the chain elongation uh, of, these guys, um, of the RT. And so uh, what happens if you use reverse transcriptase, and that, actually this is high yield for micro, um, when you stop uh, reverse transcription, uh, that stops RNA into DNA, so therefore you're gonna back up your RNA in the cytoplasm. So be looking out for viral single-stranded RNA in the cytoplasm, uh, and that is when you're stopping reverse transcriptase. Where you also have the next step, once you have that double-stranded DNA, you actually integrate this into the genome. And so uh, this newly formed DNA enters the host cell nucleus, and then is inserted into the host DNA. And this is using uh, a, an enzyme known as integrase. So this integrase comes along and is produced um, from uh, the virus itself. And so um, what we can actually do is we can target this enzyme, which is nice. This is known as integrase inhibitors. This is another class of drugs. Um, and if we block this, we have converted it into DNA, but we can't put it into the genome. And so we have a backup of viral DNA, uh, double-stranded DNA in the cytoplasm. And that's what we can find. We can also find it in the nucleus as well. So just backup overall in the cell um, because it's not being integrated. And then next we have transcription. So we have a provirus once it's been integrated. Uh, we use the host RNA polymerase and we copy the HIV genome and mRNA um, and that helps us to kind of make those proteins. Uh, remember that this can also remain dormant in there for many years. Um, and so this is why this infection isn't always very rapid. Next is assembly. So uh, now that we've produced um, uh, some of the proteins and everything like that, uh, we actually are able to use some of the protease to cut up some of the longer chains of HIV proteins uh, in order to spit them out over onto the cell membrane, and that uh, allows for those glycoproteins, such as GP1, uh, uh, um, 
41 and GP120. Uh, Those guys were cut up from this protease, and th that is found on your envelopes. And then uh, what we do is we kind of put everything in a big sack and we butt it off the membrane of the host cell's uh, outer envelope, uh, and that is... Um, where we get our, our envelope for this virus is the cell membrane. And then lastly, once it buds, then we will mature the full virus. So here we use the protease. We cut some of the long chains of the HIV, HIV proteins into smaller individual ones, but it wasn't actually in maturing some of the proteins. So uh, we still have long proteins involved, and uh, this HIV protease cuts it after we bud. This is known as maturation. And uh, this then gathers everything together and forms the capsid and the nuclear capsid around the genome. And uh, then the reverse transcriptase kind of hides out in there. And uh, we can actually block this with protease inhibitors. So the protease is that, um, that, that thing that cuts all these things. And that is everything, all those drugs that end with Navier. Um, and so you never mess with a protease inhibitor. That's how you remember that guy. So pathogenesis, uh, we a little bit talked about this. So remember those macrophages and those T cells um, and infects those. It also uses another cell type known as dendritic cells. So macrophages, we replicated within there and then they brought it to lymph nodes. Dendritic cells bring it to lymph nodes, but they don't actually have them infecting. They actually just accumulate them on their surface. Uh, they don't internalize them and they just carry them to lymph nodes and then great, we now infect our CD4 cells. Thanks for bringing this to us in the lymph nodes. Wonderful dendritic cells, ding nuts, sheesh. So um, in immune evasion as well, so uh, this is actually super high yield. This is super weird um, because HIV is just a horrible virus. Retroviruses just make tons of mistakes all the time. So there's constantly tons of different changes in the genome and there's a bunch of just false uh, protein or like virions and stuff that they make and so some of the things that they can change because they make so many uh, genetic mistakes they can make antigenic vari variation so our immune system doesn't respond to it pro properly it also has carbohydrate masking of like target epitopes uh, this is actually super high yield this point right here um, it also can have conformational changes in the viral envelope down regulation of the host HLAs and then latency and dormancy in T cells and APCs um, these guys are all high yield. Make some flashcards. Don't miss that question uh, on on your exams. Uh, this is uh, something you definitely need to know for uh, HIV. It's like, why is someone continually having this infection? Why can't our immune system respond to it? I know it's infecting our T cells, but still we should be able to get rid of it at some point in time, but we never do, and it's because of this evasion. So cytopathic effects. So um, HIV is something that can cause syncytia, similar to our herpes virus. Um, and those actually uh, cause fusion of macrophages, which is very weird, and microglia in the brain. So this is seen in the brain. Um, this can cause encephalopathy and dementia as symptoms that uh, come up with this guy. Um, and then we also have uh, the, the spreading from, from cell to cells and immune tissues and everything like that. And so our immune antibodies uh, pretty much are ineffective against HIV. And so that's uh, when we get to this guy, we can actually talk a little bit about that. So after the acute infection, we'll be talking about what the acute infection uh, entails, but it's nice to uh, understand how is serology working, how are the virus replicating and everything like that. And you can get a nice, good picture, uh, solid picture of how HIV uh, kind of works. So in the acute infection, we obviously have cells or, um, virus replicating. So we see this massive rise in our P24 antigen. So uh, this is similar to uh, hepatitis B. You know, we have that high rise in that uh, surface antigen. Um, and that's just saying we have replicating virus. So we have a high uh, response to this. Then what happens is, um, remember that these guys as viruses replicate internally, and so they're no longer floating around the blood or lymph. They eventually get picked up from macrophages and dendritic cells, and they're living inside of T cells, and they're staying in the lymph. So I'm not really, this is a blood test that I'm, I'm gathering all this data. So I'm not really going, oh, let me suck out our lymph nodes. It's actually just let me suck out someone's blood and figure out what's floating around in there. Well, all these viruses are found hidden in cells. They're almost like latent. They're starting their latent infection. So that's why our P24 antigen no longer is really kind of floating around. It stays latent, and that's why it's in a low concentration. And that's um, um, that's important. But it's also because not only is this cell late, or these replicating uh, virions latent or just replicating and staying within the cells and not really popping out and they're actually going from cell to cell causing syncytia, 
but there's still P24 floating around. It's still spilling out into the blood, and so we should be able to pick it up. However, remember, after a certain amount of time, we create antibodies, and these are anti-HIV antibodies, and they bind that GP120, um, and also we have uh, G, uh, P24 antigen-binding-specific bi antibodies, and both of these kind of rise in serum, and they neutralize and bring out. They uh, kind of remove all this P24 and this GP120 um, antigen that's flying around all over the place. So that's why this also decreases here. Um, it's not just because we no longer have this P24 flying around uh, because our cells are, our, our viruses are inside of cells hiding um, and not spitting it out into serum, but it's also because we're neutralizing it with some of the antibodies. In addition, uh, another thing that's found on here, we also see our CD4 count um, decreasing. And this is obvious because we're causing an infection in our CD4 cells, and so they're dying off, and that's why uh, their titers are, are going down throughout the progression of this. But you might ask, well, why is there this peak and then decrease and then peak and then uh, kind of decrease overall? So pretty much what happens is we have macrophages and dendritic cells saying, hey, look what I found. And so our T cells are going, hey, look what you found. And they're responding. And so they're proliferating and cells are going and responding to an infection, similar to any infection we would, would find, right? Um, they're getting in, invaded in the process, obviously, but they are responding and they are proliferating as if it's a normal upper respiratory tract infection or something. We're going to see an increase in our T cell count. However, it goes down because a lot of these cells are dying, right? They're responding, but when they respond to the scene, they get killed. And so that's actually what, what is happening here is they're proliferating, they're responding, and then they're dying. And that is how and why these peaks are found within uh, this graph. So um, as far as uh, the symptoms and how this comes up, so acute retroviral syndrome, this is the first stage that we talked about. This is a flu-like symptoms. It's kind of masked and very similar to a lot of infections, it's severe sore throat and fever and mono-like symptoms. So when someone has a flu-like symptoms, it's nice to get at least a nice brief sexual history uh, to figure out are they sexually active, homosexually active or something like that, or do they do drugs? Do you do IV drug use, right? That's why we ask them in history, why uh, do you do any recreation drugs? Do you take heroin or anything like that? Do you do IV cocaine or whatever? So those sorts of things um, we need to be asking our patients um, because that gets a nice picture and helps bring in diagnoses such as HIV. Um, in term five, you're going to get a case uh, of a patient that has HIV, but pretty much they come in and say, I have a sore throat. So you're thinking, oh, it's a, a head and neck exam and everything like that. And if you're not asking proper questions, you will never get the diagnosis of HIV. This person has acute infection of HIV, um, be looking out for those severe sore throats. Um, then what happens is after we have the seroconversion, we start producing antibodies. Um, we're going to have this window period where our HIV test is negative, our antibodies are negative because they're kind of neutralized. And this is similar to um, like a hepatitis B infection. However, uh, we can look for viral load specifically, and that actually will be positive and it will be very, very high, and that's done by, by a PCR. And uh, this is something that we want to do. This is part of our fourth gen. Um, uh, ELISA is we check for antibodies, and if they're in this window period, it'll be negative for antibodies. Uh, however, we can check viral load, and those will be high, and that'll be a confirmed test that this person actually has HIV. So we do those things kind of uh, simultaneously. Also, uh, later stage, we start seeing opportunistic infections, which is found uh, in the later stage when our CD4 count starts dropping, and that's when we're more associated, again, with those less than 200, sometimes less than 500s. You can see things like candida infections and such. And then uh, once we start seeing opportunistic infections, we now can classify that as AIDS if our CD4 count is above 200. If it is 200, even if there's no opportunistic infections, we still call that AIDS. So less than 200 AIDS or greater than 200 and opportunistic infections. So treatment for this, we talked about these a little bit as far as incorporation to the stages of their life cycle. And so these can be your non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, so NNRTIs. Uh, these guys are specifically ineffective to HIV-2. This is very high yield for farm. In addition to, um, it could be asked as a question in uh, micro as well.
NRTIs, nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, are our kind of uh, go-to first line that we use. Protease inhibitors, we do use these as well. Fusion inhibitors, uh, CCR5 antagonists, uh, such as Maraviroc, um, and our integrase strand inhibitors, which we like using as well, which is your INSTIs. So now let's talk a little bit about AIDS and some of the infections that come from this. So AIDS, like I was saying, is a CD4 count less than 200 or the development of opportunistic infections. Uh, this is very important for you to understand. So uh, things that come upon are candida, fungal infections, all those sorts of things, and we'll be discussing each of these uh, in later slides. Um, and then progression, pretty much, we, we have uh, discovered and talked about. So some of the bacterial infections that are associated with AIDS that you should know, um, pneumonia is very common. So just think of the most common community-acquired pneumonia, and that is streptococcus pneumoniae. Now, we know this is just a pathogenic uh, organism, and it can cause pneumonia in me. I don't have AIDS, um, but it can cause uh, pneumonia in general population. However, just think of how worse it is in someone that has AIDS. So obviously we need to bring this up. This is important. This is a common cause of death in patients. Uh, it's not the most common, but it is a common cause of death in patients. And uh, so the, these guys are kind of colonization of the oropharynx. Remember these virulence factors like IgA protease and it has a pneumolysin. Um, and then it stimulates inflammation with that pneumolysin and kills it. In addition, it has things that would stimulate it, such as tachoic acid and peptidoglycan, or peptidoglycan. <laughs> and uh, it also evades uh, the uh, phagocytes through that polysaccharide capsule. Remember, our sickle cell patients or patients that don't have spleens are more prone to these types of infections, but also AIDS patients because we don't have an immune system to respond to it properly. Uh, it also causes severe pneumonia and dissemination. And remember, when you have strep pneumo uh, dissemination, meningitis is common. So be uh, careful and looking out for those guys, right? Um, and then another infection that's super important is uh, your Mycobacterium avium complex or MAC uh, complex. And this is about 20 to 30% of AIDS patients actually have this. Um, it's CD4 count less than 50. This is the only thing you should know for CD4 count less than 50. Um, uh, and uh, it can cause a solitary nodule, acid fasting, um, but however, it is TB negative, so it will be a tuberculin uh, negative test. Um, and I actually want to reiterate this, this CD less than 50. They like asking, what is the specific 50 for, for this guy? Um, but remember, once you're less than 50, all the infections that we're about to talk about can show up, right? So it's literally starting to include more and more as your CD4 count decreases. But this is something that they like to point out in stems, and it's more like a TB-like syndrome, but it's TB negative, and that is going to be your MAC complex. So uh, it can cause disseminated similar tuberculosis and lymphadenitis in children and stuff like that uh, that might have AIDS um, and those sorts. Tuberculosis, so this is actually the leading cause of death among patients with AIDS. Um, it is not the most common infection. It is the most common death-causing infection in patients with AIDS. Uh, salmon, uh, salmonella, it can cause uh, kind of chronic bloody diarrhea, vomiting, fever, recurrent episodes. It also can cause Ryder syndrome, which is conjunctivitis, urethritis, and reactive arthritis, um, which is kind of rare for uh, GI infections from salmonella as well. Uh, Bartonella hensleyae, we have talked about this, is your cat scratch disease. So it can cause regional lymphadenopathy that is chronic and it stays there. And that is chronic cat scratch disease, but it can also cause tumor-like growth, which is known as basilar angiomatosis. This is a vascular proliferative disease. It's very, very similar to Kaposi sarcoma, um, but it's caused from Bartonella hensleyae. And uh, so it looks bright red skin patches, very similar to Kaposi's. Uh, however, how you differentiate it is based on H&E staining. So remember, this is a bacteria. So what do you think responds to bacteria normally? Well, neutrophils. So that's how you know that this is bacillary angiomatosis, where Kaposi's is caused from HHV8, which is a virus. So we're going to have lymphocytes responding to, to that guy. So now on to our viral infections. So um, viral hepatitis is actually quite common among patients that have HIV AIDS. Why? Because HIV and hepatitis B and C can be incorporated with IV drug use. So these are patients that uh, are high risk of contracting all these illnesses. Um, and if you have hepatitis B and C and HIV, you're not going to be fighting off those infections. You're going to have chronic 
uh, liver damage, liver cancer, cirrhosis, and you can have an increased uh, risk of liver toxins such as alcohol in production of acetaldehyde and acetaminophen uh, in production of your napki. Uh, you can also see decrease in anti, uh, like HBS, HBC antibodies because now our immune system is not responding. You lose your memory T cells. If you lose your memory T cells, you lose that stimulation of your B cell that were producing the antibodies and so you're no longer producing uh, those HB, uh, S and C antibodies. So cytomegalovirus is another guy. Remember we mentioned that this is when it's less than 100 you can get that cotton wool retinitis um, and that can cause blindness. And then uh, GI esophagitis we, we've talked about in the GI section and respiratory tract like pneumonia and such. Uh, remember this is also associated with kidney transplants uh, and that is uh, high yield to know. Uh, human herpes virus, uh, HHV1 or 2, also known as herpes simplex virus or HSV1 and 2. Uh, this is usually uh, worse as CD4 count drops, which really any infection does, but they emphasize that viral shedding increases when you have CD4 count that decreases. And uh, this causes sores and like cold sores or genital sores that last a lot longer and they stay there, they're persistent. Also, uh, this can cause meningitis for HHV2 or HSV2 and uh, encephalitis in HHV1 or HSV1. And this is very bad because it causes brain damage and blindness. Um, and this is reactivation encephalitis. You're gonna talk about this more in the CNS section, uh, but this is something that causes reactivation of encephalitis. You see something that's describing that in a stem, I want you to be thinking of this actually first before most of anything else. Um, and then dissemination could be very, very life-threatening and very dangerous. This has come up on exam questions, so definitely know that disseminated um, HSV1 or HSV2 plus HIV infection and uh, AIDS progression is very, very bad with these, or very dangerous. Uh, human papillomavirus, uh, this is more associated with women's cervical cancer, increased risk because we're not fighting off that virus anymore because our T cells are dead. Um, so that makes sense, right? And uh, progressive multifocal uh, leukoencephalopathy, but this is caused from a polyomavirus known as JC virus, um, and this is when you have a CD4 count less than 20. Uh, similar presentation, similar to multi multiple sclerosis, except it kind of stays for a while. So this is like hemiparesis, unilateral blindness, and sensory loss. It's not like it it doesn't come and then go similar like multi multiple sclerosis. Um, but also can cause speech problems. So some, someone with weird uh, neurological problems plus HIV or they were an IV drug user, be looking for this. Now so on to some of the uh, fungal infections uh, that are associated with AIDS. So candida uh, can cause mucosal dissemination. I, I think we is um, beating a dead horse with this. We brought this up multiple times with oral pharyngeal less than 500 and esophageal less than 100. Vulvovaginal um, infection uh, can also be associated with AIDS, but it's associated with general yeast infections as well. Um, but also, uh, candida can cause pneumonia and dissemination. It's more rare, um, but it is more associated with AIDS than anything else. Um, and, and that is uh, your candida albicans. And then cryptococcus, uh, this guy is actually kind of interesting. Uh, so when your CD4 count is less than 100, uh, you can have fungal meningitis caused from cryptococcus. So remember, this is your only encapsulated or polysaccharide capsule uh, yeast. It's only encapsulated yeast. You get it from soil and bird and uh, bat droppings and um, produces this enzyme known as phenyl oxidase. Uh, and we can actually test for that. In addition, it grows at 37 degrees. And we would do our India ink staining on CSF. Uh, extraction when we do a lumbar puncture, um, but we can also do our mucocarmine stain for that capsule to see as well. Um, and you'll be uh, more introduced to this and the details of its badness in the CNS section uh, later on. Pneumocystis girovecci, or PCP, um, or pneumococcal, um, or pneumocystic uh, pneumoniae, uh, which is uh, PCP. This is your CD4 uh, count when it's less than 200, so just the general AIDS uh, criteria for pneumocystis. This is actually the most common infection found in AIDS patients, the most common infection. It leads to death in some patients, but not always. We can also just treat it, um, and it, it's not super problematic, um, but it is the most common. TB is the most common death 
defining AIDS illness. Uh, so that's uh, important to know those guys. So it causes interstitial pneumo uh, pneumonitis, and uh, plasma cells kind of respond to this, and we can use antiretrovirals to pretty much prevent this from uh, accumulating in, in this patient's lungs. And it's usually almost is exclusive to HIV in AIDS patients. You don't see it in any, any, anybody else. Um, and uh, this can be causing a non-productive cough. It's dry. Uh, nothing comes up. And this is that candy cotton exudate on histology. And we'd be looking for cysts and trophozoites. Uh, even though this is a fungus, it doesn't respond to uh, fungal uh, antifungals because it does not have ergosterol in its membrane. And usually we target ergosterol synthesis or ergosterol itself specifically um, uh, as far as fungal infections, but this guy doesn't have it, so it, we'd be doing nothing with antifungals. And so we'd actually have to treat it with cotrimoxazole, which we actually use for urinary tract infections and stuff like that. Uh, this is actually a combination of two drugs, which you'll learn in form. So now some of the parasites that are associated with AIDS. So toxoplasmus, uh, pl plasmosis, this is Toxoplasma gondii, uh, is the most common CNS infection with AIDS. Um, and it can lead to encephalitis, like headache, confusion, motor weakness. It's spread via cats and their poop. Uh, and so just think, you know, crazy cat ladies or think old cat ladies, you know. Um, and uh, what happens is on CT, we can actually see ring enhancing lesions. So there's actually a, a few things that we can see ring enhancing lesions in the brain. You're going to come across uh, in the CNS section, you're going to talk about ring enhancing lesions such as an abscess. And that's usually staph or something like that that can cause that. It's usually one lesion. Now, if you see multiple, toxoplasma should be popping in, especially if they're AIDS patients. AIDS plus multiple ring enhancing lesions, you're thinking of toxo as uh, the top of your list. Right? Other ring enhancing you're gonna learn about in, um, in uh, PATH. Some, some tumors actually have ring enhancing lesions. Um, such as your gl uh, glioblastoma multiforme can have a ring enhancing lesion, but that's usually very large and crosses from one hemisphere to the next. <clears throat> that's your butterfly lesion, but remember it is that ring enhancing lesion as well. So cryptococ uh, or cryptosporidium parvum, so we talked about this in our GI section. This is a very common cause of uh, kind of persistent diarrhea in patients. Uh, this is associated when you have CD4 count less than 100, and um, it's due to contaminated food and water or swimming pools and stuff like that. It's very common in children. It's the most common cause of chronic diarrhea in children and it causes dehydration, malnutrition, cholecystitis in HIV patients and it can be uh, could be self-limiting in HIV patients when they have a CD4 count greater than 200 uh, but when it's less it's it's a problem. We can also do acid fasting of those. Remember what those look like. Go back to those slides. Um, they're little pink little circle guys. Uh, another guy we talked about in our multi-systems and our skin is uh, leishmaniasis, and it's often associated with the visceral type in AIDS patients. And uh, remember, that's with those sand flies. So the sand fly is out in the desert, and they're on, on, on leashes. It's a leash mania. Oh, my gosh. Okay, um, usually find this in Bangladesh and Brazil, Ethiopia, India, Sudan, those places. Um, you'll have uh, pretty much all these symptoms down here, including hepatosplenomegaly and anemia. Now on to the cancers and neurology. This is one of the last uh, things we're going to be discussing in this module. Um, and uh, Kaposi sarcoma, which is caused from HHV8 or human herpes virus 8. This is very high yield to know um, for, for exam purposes. And this is pretty much a tumor of blood vessels. And we have to differentiate it from bacillary angiomatosis caused from Bartonella henselii, which is your cat scratch disease. Why? Um, because they look a very similar presentation uh, to one another. And so pretty much what you got to do is look at H&E of one of these guys, and this is what's found in this guy's gums right here. It's kind of gross. Um, and those are lymphocytes that are responding. So this is a virus inside cells, and you think what responds to intracellular uh, organisms, and that's going to be your lymphocytes. Um, the, the one exception, I actually want to bring you back to that, uh, just a little bit of reminder, kind of tie-in to lymphocytic response. So there's actually one bacteria that you should know that lymphocytes actually respond to that is extracellular. If you can think of that, I did emphasize this uh, when we discussed it in uh, respiratory section, um, and it causes a cough that is severe in children, that it gets to the point where they cough so much that they vomit. Uh, and hopefully you're thinking of whooping cough. Uh, 
And uh, that is actually the guy that causes um, a lymphocytic uh, response to an extracellular bacteria, which is very abnormal. And so we kind of think that, uh, kind of associate that with more of a viral infection, but uh, we would be wrong. So that was just a, a little bit of tie-in back into respiratory. Well, any reminders we can get uh, is good. These are pink, uh, red, purple lesions, as you can see, uh, and this guy's face, or this, uh, his gums. So other things are non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, um, and they origin originate in lymphocytes um, within the lymph nodes, um, but they also can be in lymph tissue found in the brain. So if you have an HIV patient with neurological symptoms, we look at CAT scan and we see a tumor growing be thinking, ah, this is most likely a lymphoma, a B cell lymphoma of the brain uh, or in the brain. This is very high yield. This showed up on both micro and uh, path um, questions. So definitely be uh, keeping that in mind. Uh, also, it increases risk of other um, viral infections and stuff like that, um, such as HTLV, hepatitis C, and EBV. Guillain-Barre, remember I mentioned that uh, HIV can cause Guillain-Barre, so I just wanted to, to, to reiterate that as well. And lastly, our last syn syndrome that we want to want to talk about is IRIS, or Immune Reconstruction Inflammatory Syndrome. This was kind of confusing. They weren't uh, really good at explaining what the heck was happening. Um, and so I hopefully can describe this so it, it makes sense to you. So they described it as a paradoxical worsening of infectious process followed by HAART and, uh, in HIV patients. So um, <clears throat> that doesn't quite mean as much unless you understand what is happening. So remember, our HIV infects our immune cells and our immune cells drop a number. And so we have no response to infection. So we get an opportunistic infection such as TB and MAC and pneumocystis and all those things like we have just dis been discussing in the last you know, 10 minutes or so. And so these patients have these underlying infections, right? TB, MAC, pneumocystis, cryptococcus, all those things, right? And so our immune system is not responding. So they're not having symptoms really associated with it as much as someone that has an immune system. Why? It's because remember, uh, back in immunology, you learn about immunopathology. So take influenza, for example. Why, when you have influenza, do you have a cough? Well, that is straight up damage to your uh, respiratory epithelium because of the virus replicating in it. That totally makes sense. But why do you have muscle aches? Why do I have... Uh, leg muscle aches and chest muscle aches and arm muscle aches and neck muscle aches when I have influenza. Well, there's no virus in my blood all over the place. That would be really bad. It's actually your immune response, your cytokines that are secreted in your immune response cause all that myalgia and fever and, and pain that you're, that you're having. And that is why um, this uh, is an overall syndrome of influenza virus, right? Well, here, these patients don't have an immune system that are responding. So they're missing the entire immunopathology aspect. They just are having, what does TB do uh, as far as direct damage effects? So maybe lung infection or disseminated infection. And that's straight up what damage is TB doing? MAC and pneumocystis. Now what happens when we initiate HAART uh, treatment on patients, we bump up their immune system. And now all these immune cells are in the midst of massive infections of TB and MAC and pneumocystis and all these other guys, right? And so they're sitting there going, whoa, where did all this come from? Now it's pretty much just think of it as this person had underlying sepsis. And we now introduced a strong immune response in someone that has sepsis. Guess what happens? It worsens. It gets worse. We have strong immunopathology plus the pathology from the infection itself. And so that actually is what happens after HART um, initiation in these patients. And so the factors that determine how bad iris is pretty much are how suppressed were the patient's immune system before we gave them that HART. Um, and then how quickly did that immune system ramp up after we initiated this? Um, and how, uh, how low did we bring our viral load, right? So those sorts of things kind of interplay on how quickly our immune cell respond or grow back and then respond overload uh, to where there's strong immunopathology and this uh, could progress this person's, uh, you know, all sorts of damage from whatever the, the infection they had underlying.
And so uh, what actually happens as far as the cellular level is a rapid increase of CD45 rho positive T cells. Um, these are pretty much uh, your memory T cells, or your memory T cells are these 45 rho uh, positive uh, T cells. Um, that, those are your memory cells, and so we see a rapid increase in there. And then later on, we see a second slow increase in T cells, and these are because we're making new naive T cells in our uh, thymus, and those are your CD45 Ra positive and CD62 L positive uh, naive T cells. Now you're thinking, oh gosh, C more CD markers. I already learned a ton in immuno. Um, it's not really important to know the CD markers here. I mean, it's maybe nice to be able to recognize in case they ask you that detail, but usually they're more asking questions. Do you know that the initial is memory T cells that bump up and then the second slow increase is just simply naive T cells responding? And uh, this rise can lead to inflammatory response because this person might have an underlying uh, opportunistic infection floating around and now our immune cells are working and that can lead to immunopathology as we have discussed. And so that pretty much ends the module on HIV and AIDS. Uh, thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe and like and, um, and subscribe to the channel as well. And uh, we'll be discussing our CNS module uh, coming up hopefully this weekend or next week. Uh, and uh, that uh, should be quite informative uh, and, and fun for you guys. So uh, I wish you the very best and happy studying. And if you have any questions, post on my Facebook page or even here on the YouTube video as well.